All right, we are back on another Sunday night with Ecoustics, the founder, the owner, Brian Mitchell. How you doing, Brian? Thank you, Gene. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm not Ian White tonight. Some of you may have met him the last couple of weeks, our editor in chief. Um, but uh, um, I'm taking the reins for tonight, and um, hope you'll be a little bit entertained and informed. So thank you. Thank yeah, you, you know, Gene. Um, yeah. Uh, you told me backstage is the first time you're actually on YouTube. So that's kind of cool that you're breaking your uh, YouTube virgin <laughs> well, bubble with us. Well, first YouTube live stream. Oh, live stream. I did, okay. I did crack the YouTube bubble um, with a British audiophile about a week or two ago. Uh, long interview with, um, with Taryn. I don't know if you know him, but um, no. really good hi-fi channel if you're in the two-channel audio. I would go check him out and uh, yeah, but we've just been um, doing phenomenal at acoustics.com really built up a exciting new team led by Ian White um, yeah. as editor in chief. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got, a, we have three Instagram influencers I'm pretty proud of that are great contributors. Um, we have a podcast producer Mitch Anderson, um, who's been great with our podcast. And uh, our latest podcast is called um, Losing the Next Generation of Audiophiles. And mm. I think it's a it's a pretty important topic. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Gene, on kind of Yeah, the... I mean that it that is a that is an important topic. In fact, I, I was talking about that last week when I had on that woman um Dua on to talk about the um the Amazon Echo speaker. It's like we need to get young people involved in audio, or this is going to be a dying, um, a dying passion. It's going to die with us, right? We're kind of like right. we're the torchbearers right now. We're kind of older, but we're not that old. Mm -hmm. But the primary two channel guys are older than us, and yep. they're dying off, or they're losing their hearing, unfortunately. And if we don't bring this to the next generation and make it enticing enough for people to want to listen to high mm -hmm. fidelity then it's just going to kind of go into the abyss and people are you know going to be content with their with their airpods or their beats headphones and, and that'll be the end of it so we're trying to prevent that obviously we want to <laughs> right. appeal to more people i think we actually have an article by jerry de Colliano. I, i'm sure you remember him from yeah, home theory, no, him. Fi, home theory right. review i'm sorry right he basically said that a lot of these dealers should be demoing uh systems with games and none of them have a gaming mm -hmm. system attached. I mean, that gaming industry is bigger than the movie industry and the porn industry combined. And Sir, they're, yep. they're not trying to bring those two together. And that's really what yep. you should be doing. No, that's a huge misstep. And I mean, gaming um, kind of kind of segues us into headphones because almost every right. gamer uses headphones. Um, but they don't necessarily use audiophile grade headphones they're using generally something labeled or quote unquote gaming headphone but i think i think we can agree they're not up to the same standard as a lot of the higher fidelity headphones would you agree with that or oh yeah definitely the gaming ones because they don't really emphasize the sound quality or they don't look at the research that guys like Sean Olive have done from Harmon. And, and let's preface that by saying you don't have to spend massive amounts of money to get audiophile grade headphones. I mean, right. Harmon, you know, the AKG stuff, they make headphones for three or $400 a pair wired pair of headphones that meet the target curve. They sound great. They play plenty loud right. and they're durable. And, the, and hopefully they don't clamp down on your head and hurt your head. I mean, you got to also worry about having a comfortable headphone as well. So I think it's it's a great time to be alive as an audiophile, even if you don't have, have big speakers in your house. Getting mobile audio, getting a good DAC and get a good headphones could be done really on the cheap today, more so right. than ever. And 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 you got, you know, more software. I mean, you have binaural recordings, which really sound incredible on headphones. I don't know if you've done a lot of listening with binaural. Oh, recordings. yeah. Binaural is is incredible. Um, Sony 360 and the Dolby Atmos immersive. I believe that's the future of headphone listening and home listening, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so that's a that's a topic we'll get to when I start to get into the show. But 
um, circling back to kind of losing this generation or trying to build the next generation. I have a theory on this, but I'm going to run it by you. Who do you think had the biggest impact on hi-fi or headphones in the last 10 to 15 years? Does anyone come to mind? I mean, from a marketing standpoint, I mean, yep. Beats by Dr. Dre was kind of the breaking point for the yep. young people wanting to get into headphones, right? Yep. Otherwise, they would just use whatever came with their phones. Exactly. That was that was the exact point that I was going to make. Like, I think Dr. Dre did more for the headphone and anti-fi industry than almost anyone else I can think of. Because yeah. It, because it got people into the mindset of wearing over-ear headphones like you and I both have now, which... Right which prior to like 2008, 2009, nobody was wearing. <coughs> and uh, so they, 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 <clears throat> they popped. Uh, they made it cool. They made it posh. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> Hopefully I'm not dying over here. <laughs> but <coughs> may have to have some water real quick. Sorry yeah, that, that. That, that happens. Trust me. Yeah, so I mean, Dr. Dre definitely, he kind of got screwed out of the whole sale of beats from what I remember. But he well, did didn't they sell faith. for, I think they sold for like $3 billion to Apple, right? Yeah. But, but I don't think screwed. he got a lot of that money. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, but back to your point, um, he made headphones cool. Yeah. And that was something that the audiophile, the home theater, industry has never been able to grasp onto there's never yeah, i mean been... we're missing we're missing like rock stars you know in the industry right like you've got you know you've got some speaker designers that are well known but they're not really rock stars they're not really like you got your andrew jones he's a nice guy but he's not like mm -hmm. super cool guy you know it's like right and i hate to say it because i don't like the whole marketing aspect to begin with but in some cases you need it because you want this to become more mainstream or at least to right. keep it alive but you know the mm -hmm. one thing the one saving grace i see now with covid um i haven't been to a movie since before covid i don't know too many people that go to movies these days and everything is streaming now i don't even watch my cable box anymore i stream hbo <laughs> exactly. max disney plus Same. so it's kind of caused a, a resurgence in home theater in people's houses and mm -hmm people are watching and entertaining more. And then you also have Apple music and you have title and you have Amazon all streaming immersive audio, which I thought we'd never see the day mm -hmm. I spent, I spent about an hour and a half last night, just going through Apple music, looking at all the immersive soundtracks and starring the ones that are good. And then like deleting the ones that aren't right. And I never, I never listened to music like this two years ago, two years ago, I get a ultra HD Blu-ray or I'd get a DVD audio disc. Mm -hmm. I'd, you know, and I'd go and put that on and listen to it. Now I have at my fingertips incredibly high fidelity right. audio, whether it's in immersive or if it's in lossless two channel. Mm -hmm. And go back a couple of years ago, and that was not as easy to get streaming wise. Right. Um, in fact, yes. you couldn't get Atmos streaming a few years ago. <laughs> right. Like this is a huge breakthrough. Um, and I just came from Can Jam SoCal 2021 which is essentially the high-end headphone show. Right. And you would think they'd be covering this. They'd be all over this because it's really the future. Yet it was nowhere to be found at this high-end show. So that was kind of one of the disappointments for me. As that is crazy. So you're thinking with all this technology now yeah. with the head tracking and the binaural and the Atmos. <coughs> and Sorry. You're, you're not going to cough up a lung on I'm me. Trying, right? I'm trying not to. <laughs> So they didn't have any of this at that show. Was it just strictly two channel for headphones? And yeah, I mean, it was all the high end headphones, kind of like some of the ones that you're wearing now. Um, so the real talk of the show was the Odyssey LCD five, um, mm -hmm. which is a forty five hundred dollar headphone. That's not and, very appealing to the next generation. <laughs> right. It's <laughs> like, um, how many people you know are going to spend even $450 on headphones? And they're going to go, that's crazy. Um, like, uh, so they're really targeting um, the extreme head fi people who just kind of obsess over headphones and measurements and um, 
just getting every last inch out of headphone sound. Um, but I mean, you unfortunately, I wasn't able to try those out at the show because there was a line. Um, and I think there was only one pair there. So you had to wait. It was like the holy uh, grail of headphones. <laughs> um, there was like a four minute timer. <laughs> Everybody was lined up to hear them. Um, I'm sure I'll hear them at some point. And the, the, <clears throat> And the word on the street is you got to hear them, but you also have to hook them up to a high-end headphone amp. And then you're going to want a nice stack to go with it or preamp. So this isn't just like you spend $4,500 and you have the perfect headphone system. You're still adding on another two, 3000 um just to get the best out of them so um, so what were they doing at the show were they spraying off the headphones so you know for covid reasons and yeah they were wiping them down um yeah i mean most of the over ears were getting wiped down there wasn't a lot of in-ears that were being sampled um because i think that was just more of the ick factor of so that somebody brought up with their like exotic cables on these headphones like nordost I'm imagining um, there was probably some exotic cable vendors there trying to sell snake oil with the $4,500 headphones, right? There, there may have been. I didn't see a lot of crazy cabling there, um, or at least it didn't. Well, that's a good uh, I, I didn't see the vendors there. There may have been some of the cabling there. Um, but 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 the show had, I, I believe, around 25 different vendors. And because of COVID, all of the European vendors that sell headphones dropped out um so oh, it was wow a, it was a little smaller show um but was it I a mean, ghost town like cedia um no i mean it was it was crowded for the popular stuff but then there were tables of stuff i think headphones.com was there and they had pretty much all the other high-end headphones on a table like your focal utopias uh Dan Clark Stealth is one of the other new ones. Um, head by Head Audio. I don't know right. if you've seen those. They're kind of like bricks on your ear. They're so big. Oh, um, that doesn't sound comfortable. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, so strangely, like none of these headphones really focus on comfort. And that right. is the most, <clears throat> that's the most important factor for yeah. most of the headphone buying public. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a stat, there's a uh, metric called clamping force. And right. when I was talking to Sean Olive about that, that is something that they look at with headphones. I can't tell you how many times I've had headphones where um, upon first listen, I loved them. And then after leaving them on my head for more than 20 or 30 minutes, it started hurting my, my cartilage in my ears. I'm like, <laughs> right. I'll never put these headphones on again. Or exactly. there's a lot of headphones are too heavy, like the brick ones you're talking about. I wouldn't right. want something on my head that weighs a couple of pounds. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's some of the trade-offs right now to get the highest possible sound out of headphones. Um, but I did find I did I did watch your talks with Sean Oliver. Sean Olive, sorry. <laughs> I think I called him Oliver. Um, Sean oh, Olive of Harmon. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Um, this is live, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, those were fascinating conversation you had with him. If people want to go back and learn about the Harmon curve and the research that Harmon is doing, um, it's pretty phenomenal on how, how they can predict whether you'll like a headphone yeah. based on how close with, it is to the Harmon. With like an 86% probability. That's a pretty damn good odds there. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's And he's measured like virtually every major headphone on the market. He's got this whole database, which I'm going to try to publish on Audioholics. I got to just figure out a nice way or an easy way to do that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's cool the amount of... It just shows you how the market is shifting because Harman is now putting all... Besides the car audio, which is their biggest moneymaker... Mm -hmm. uh headphones are now their focus more than yeah. anything more that you, you don't hear a whole lot about their loudspeakers as much as they do as mm. the research now they're doing on headphones and there's way more money in headphones you know it's just a bigger market right so i wanted to share my screen real quick so everybody could see uh there's a link in our um description about acoustics no thanks and you me. have a little you have a basically you did a show report here and i put this image as the main image and sure. i can see some some fancy cabling going yep. on over here. <laughs> that may <laughs> be yeah um 
maybe I have like cable. I have like fancy cable filters that I just don't always just, keep them. That's because I've been I've been hitting you in the head with with uh, the theory on cables for twenty years, so you know right, better right. now. You just ignore the nonsense. Right. Yeah. So that was a little bit of the line to hear the Odyssey LCD five. Funny, I always called them Audes. I didn't realize it was Odyssey. Odyssey I, sounds like Odyssey room correction. I know. I I believe I believe i was told it was odyssey kind of like probably the, right i'm probably saying I, it wrong. I don't know i could be wrong um i know the company is not too far from me in california so somebody better contact me and tell me that i said it right or wrong um or somebody yeah. <laughs> in the chat um this but, this yeah, headphone yeah. amplifier reminds me of um i have a focus right um mm -hmm. mic preamp that i'm using and it's like for some reason pro audio they like to use the red colors and i guess they're Right. Kind of bleed, bleeding off into the high end headphone amplifier market as well. It's pretty. Right. Yeah. No, that one's uh, pretty nice. I mean, the interesting thing is most of the headphones are open back that are top of the line ones. I mean, there are certainly top of the back, top of the line closed back. Um, that's the, that one right there is the Hi Fi Man um, HE 400 SE. That's the yeah, one Ian know. talked about. Um, 150 bucks. It's 150 dollars. Um, really hard to beat that uh, as a headphone. Hi-Fi Man has um, some really good headphones out there, all the way up to your six thousand dollar Susvara headphone. Um, that's the Dan Clark Stealth. It's your. It's. Damn. That's your other. <laughs> you got graphite in there, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's another four thousand dollar headphone uh if you like the way that one looks and sounds and um uh but yeah meze audio is another popular headphone brand they have a new one just came out the the elite um just replaced their uh their their empyrean model uh, which was their previous top of the line uh, ten thousand dollars that was the complete system um Jeez. if you <laughs> If you add in those um, those headphones with the iFi, I think it was their there was their Pro Signature um, DAC preamp um, and headphone amp. That combo right there, uh, I believe it's twenty seven fifty each for each of those two boxes on top, um, and that's oh the goodness. that's the iFi. And then on the bottom of that is a Burson. I forget the model number, um, but this is really when you're comparing headphone amps and trying to pull out subtle differences in the headphones. And um, if you're spending a couple thousand on headphone amps. Um, the wall of diminishing returns <laughs> hits very quickly with a headphone amp. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but that was uh, that was how I got to sample those at the show. And you come away after you hear these back to back to back. Um, and then you go to some, some of the less expensive brands like VZR, um, which is a new audiophile gaming headphone. And yeah, I never heard of them. Yeah. They just, um, they just launched, I believe this year. Um, the founder came from Apple. Um, so he worked, uh, I believe under Steve jobs in the Steve jobs era with the iPod and some of their early um apple products um so he brings a lot of experience into that um that hmm. was the headphone amp from mono mono price i believe the mono oh that's down here is that this is mono price i believe so yeah those two oh, doesn't look... oh yeah you're right <laughs> didn't look like a mono price thing that's kind of cool so the mono price uses the don't they use the thx circuitry I know they do on some of their uh, some of their uh, headphone amps. I'm not sure on the tech they have in that one. Um, AU Sounds is another startup, LA based. Um, they showed the first planar magnetic planar magnetic noise canceling over the ear wireless headphone oh, if i got that all if i got that all right and it's coming out for 399 dollars. so so that's re that's reasonable and it has that's real reasonable. Tech benefit. yeah <laughs> that's um yeah that one could be one to watch um they have 
another one, uh, I guess the previous screen might have been their 199 model. I believe that's their wireless noise canceling. And they're really trying to go after the Sony and Bose customer at this $200 price point. Um, right. But yeah, new startup to look at, AU Sounds, um, that I was able to try out. And um, Focal was certainly, um, they certainly had a lot of headphones there. They weren't part of the show, but um, I think those are the clear MGs and that's the Utopia. Wow. They're top of the line. Um, I think that's another $4,000 Focal headphone. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I, I believe it's really just the open back. I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I think you have the top of the line closed back on your head. The yes. Stelia from Focal, yeah. and that's the top of the line open back. Right. It's good stuff. It's, um, it's not for but, the cheap. It's not for the <laughs> faint of wallet. Though. Yeah. Well, sound ID is kind of one of my new favorite things to talk about, and it kind of correlates a little bit to some of the Harman technology. And what they're really trying to do is personalize your, your listening curve and mm -hmm. give you um, what they're, it's a little bit hard to explain, but they're combining the known characteristics and output of the headphone. And then they run you through a listening test. And based on your answers to that question, it gives you a readjusted curve. Does it actually and, measure your hearing? Because I know like the anchor <laughs> ones I have does that. Um, this one, at least the version that I tested did not measure my hearing. That may be, um, that may be something that they're working on. I know they used to adjust for age. Um, uh, and they kind of, I think they ask you your age and gender and um, yep. they use some of, they use some of that generic data combined with your preference data. And um, the interesting part is you do get a better sounding um, response from the same headphone that you just tried without it. Um, right. And, and then what they're really going for though, is they're trying to build that. They're trying to build their technology inside the headphone. So it can essentially be reprogrammed on the fly. So oh, okay. every headphone can have a personalized EQ curve. I don't, I don't think EQ curve is the right. Yeah. Well, they the, take the, the right response. They right. take the response of the headphone that you're using in, into account of what they're doing basically. Right. And um, they currently have it in some wireless earbuds from one more. I believe it's the color buds too. Um, we just posted a review on that, um, which includes that sound ID technology. Right. Um, but sound ID as a company is trying to get their technology built into headphones. So essentially they could be reprogrammed for the Harman curve for your curve based on your hearing. Um, Does it actually I, say Harman curve in it? Or no, 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 no. I was just kind of throwing that in there as like, right you could theoretically get to that if you could reprogram them there's um you should be able to reprogram them to anything um but if you're if you reprogram them based to your hearing preferences and it sounds better like why do you want something unless the Harmon curve does sound better than your personalized well, yeah i mean i i would yes. think it really being able to personalize the curve to your own hearing is is definitely the wave of the future um especially with people that are getting older the the harman curve might not do it for them they might need a little bit more right treble boost or bass boost depending on you know the hearing loss that they have and men right. get more hearing loss high frequency hearing loss than women so fortunate for the women not fortunate for us though <laughs> yeah, I know it's uh, it's it's kind of disheartening when you realize how many of the reviewers are older, yeah, and um, and you hope that what you're um, what you're reading and watching, um, yeah, these are some of the other brands, Rawson Audio. Um, yeah. the founder of that, I don't know if you know, came from Odyssey. Odyssey. Um, left that company i don't know the whole story but started up another company under his own name 
and uh so they're now i gotta be honest with you these are these are pretty ugly (laughs) like i i would be almost embarrassed to put these on my head in front of people i don't i don't get it so all of these headphones are designed for indoor listening yeah right where nobody sees you like you're gonna get your ass kicked if you bring those on an airplane just saying <laughs> right and and they're and most of them are open back which you really don't even want to use on an airplane uh, yeah, definitely. because for people that don't know i mean i think i think most of your follower base knows that open back headphones let sound out um yep so it's not like you can listen in, in total privacy and um they're designed for at home essentially by yourself in a room listening um so that's uh yeah that's a little bit of the update on the high-end headphone space um but like i said there was a couple things not there it's like why why didn't they talk about spatial audio immersive audio um that was a big takeaway for me nothing about head tracking which i think yeah is really the future of kind of the the realism i think that's what we're going for as headphone listeners and audio files um don't we want it to sound like we're there I mean, that's the one big advantage of headphones that you can't do with most speakers without some really sophisticated DSP is you can do the binaural recordings that actually transport the sound to you. It's much right. different than just doing a bunch of speakers in a room for immersive audio. It actually physically places those devices in your head and all around you. And it's like I played that barbershop demo on mm, YouTube. Oh, right. I yeah, did it by I've accident. Yeah. yeah. I think I you sent it, me I that. Did, yeah, I didn't know it was on, and I'm sitting there working. I was listening to YouTube. Next thing I know, I heard someone downstairs at my front door. I was about ready to jump down there thinking someone broke in my house. It right. was the stupid binaural recording listening on my focals that was so realistic. Like, I was just, holy cow, why don't we have Yeah, why music? isn't... I'm Yeah, I'm perplexed by that, too. What, and what's it's not new thing? technology. Binaural's been around since, like, the 70s, 60s or 70s. I mean, it's been researched mm-hmm. for decades i think you sent me that video it's from 10 12 years ago yeah that one's old something and uh yeah you can add a link to it hopefully in the, but yeah it's a pretty fascinating just with regular headphones how you can listen off of youtube and really hear just sound from behind you over over your head in front of yep. you um that that's possible with regular headphones is kind of surprising why it didn't catch on yeah is it just the re- it's just is it just the recording techniques are they don't translate to speakers or well speakers the, it's, it's hard to do it with a with a conventional speaker i mean the polk does it with the l800s to some extent with an analog crossover by doing interroll crosstalk cancellation by having the two sets of drivers Mm-hmm. But we had on Professor Edgar, I don't remember his last name now, but we had on a guy that actually does this for a living and he can do it with regular speakers with his sophisticated DSP hardware. It's not cheap, right? but it's, it's, it's very achievable. In fact, Matthew Pose is going to be bringing it over um, to my place to do a demo and we're going to do a follow-up video on that. So supposedly you could do it with any pair of speakers and then it'll just blow you away and it'll be even <laughs> more effective than what Polk does with their uh, analog crossover scheme. So, right. yeah, I think one of the, I think one of the holdups is having it, having the same track for headphones or for speakers, but I think we have enough technology to be able to separate the two to like, know you have headphones and know you're, you're listening to speakers to kind of give you the preferred track. But I mean, well, I mean that, we do that now with Apple Music and we do it with Tidal. You know, it'll 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 default to the immersive sound soundtrack if you have if it detects you have an immersive system. Otherwise, right. it'll play the regular one. But yeah, I think I can't believe that that show that the the Can Jam show didn't have any of the new tech. It seems like they're they got their head stuck in the sand with the old audiophile ways. Yeah, I mean, and, they're still. I mean, the but the good part of that is you get there's a younger crowd at this show it's not the uh for lack of a better way of saying it it's not a lot of old white people 
at the show. Old farts. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's younger, um, younger people, more diverse. Um, and that that's the one positive is the headphone industry is bringing in younger people. Like that is, that's the, that's the one positive thing. Um, and I, I know that the headphone crowd is very into their measurements, which you should be, um, proud of for all the, mm -hmm. for all of the work that you've done in the measurement space. Um, but that's a catch 22. Like you're not going to get a lot of average customers to care about measurements. Like you're going to get, no, and you got to be careful with where you get the measurements from, because it's very difficult to accurately measure headphones. You need a very sophisticated mic system, a head and all that stuff. That's why I never really got into it. Um, it's, it's at least a $10,000 investment. And, um, there's already websites doing that a pretty good job of it. So right. like, but you know, one thing I always thought of is if you get the young people into headphones, it could be their gateway drug into mm -hmm. getting into audiophile stuff too, because I love a good headphone, like listening to it, but there's nothing like being sitting in a room, having a good pair of speakers, feeling the tactile bass energy that you just can't mm -hmm. get. You can't get that experience with a pair of headphones. I'm sorry to say, right. It's just a different experience. Like last night I was listening. Remember I was telling you about that Dominique Finis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Just <laughs> listening to that lady singing and then you up mix it in, in the, with the Dolby up mixer. And it sounds right. like a multi-channel recording, the ambience, the way that thing is, all of her music is recorded so incredibly well. And yes, I like listening to it on headphones, but I still love laying back in my Valencia seat, you know, having a drink with me and then just right. hearing and feeling the bass and just hearing it all around me. That's, that's still my ultimate go-to when I have the time. Right. But I, I do think for people that, I mean, all of your followers already know this, but you have a mega home system. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah way way better than <laughs> your average um well i guess listener. as i get older <clears throat> the equipment has to get better to compensate for my hearing loss so I, I wish i had this equipment 25 years ago when i could hear to 20 kilohertz but now i hear to right. 13 or 14 kilohertz and i right. have way better equipment than i did so i guess it kind of levels out i don't know right i think all you have to know is just tell people how tall the speakers are that are, that's all they have to know it'll scare people it'll scare women away that's for sure except for my wife my wife actually likes the look of a good looking speaker so i'm i'm very blessed to have right um, spousal approval of of what i do here a lot of guys don't have that lock no i i agree uh we need more women in the industry in the industry but as customers um women are half of the population like they buy this stuff they buy they're buying beats headphones or apple airpods like they're out there um and they're just um not a tr they're just not switching over into anything hi-fi yeah. or or home theater they're so so the way i think we could get the younger generation or get better appeal uh, obviously we want to market to the younger crowds right. with the headphones with gaming mm -hmm. but the other the other category of product that should be more out there for people is the passive sound bars because you can get very good quality passive sound bars from we just had on the president of leon speakers mm, uh, yep. last week he makes some incredible passive sound bars so you still get to use your external amplification you still get the right. high-end drivers you get the CIOS drivers or mm -hmm. whatever you, you know, whatever they use in them. So you still have your high fidelity, but you have it in a form factor that won't piss off your, your misses. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, I mean, people think sound bars are a dirty, a dirty mm -hmm. name, but they're really not. I mean, have you, I don't know if you went to see uh, before COVID, but there was a company called Theory Audio there and mm. uh, Paul Hales. Yep. I um, I didn't hear them, but Ian White, our editor in chief, he reviewed yeah. them in his listening in his in his home. I think it's like a twenty thousand dollar system. Yeah. And like he said, I mean, it was just phenomenal. Like yeah, it's he, all DSP driven. It's get they use graphite uh drivers, Kevlar yep. graph, I think graphite drivers, and you know, waveguides on the tweeters and all that stuff, and had real subwoofers and had yep. atmos discrete atmos speakers, not the bouncy house ones. So mm -hmm. I mean it was and it's in a form factor that's more attainable to people that can't put big speakers in a room. 
Um, I, of course, yep. I always recommend flush mount as well because there's a lot of advantages to doing flush mount speakers. Right. But yeah, I mean, that's really what we've been trying to do with Don and Matt on, mm -hmm. on our channel is to kind of acclimate people to alternatives, how you can get good sound without seeing the big box in the room. Obviously, I still like to have the big box, <laughs> yeah. but I could, I could respect people that don't want to have the big boxes in the room and they want to have the room decor speak right. for itself. Yeah, I mean, you can get good sound with bookshelf speakers and the subwoofer. Like, that's not... Um, even if you don't go for the center channel, like I think, I don't know, you, you, you might disagree with me on this one, but is the center channel, can it be overrated if you get a really good two channel, um, setup maybe with a sub for home? Theater? I mean, if you, get, I, if if you, you do center, a set, yeah. if you do a two channel system, right, you should have an incredibly strong phantom center, but it's only going to be for a very narrow listening area. Right. So if you're if you just have a money seat, you have your Ames chair and you're pointing it in between the two speakers, yeah, you could get away without the center channel. But if you have a row of seats or two mm. rows of seats, a, a center channel is absolutely critical because you just can't get a phantom image off axis right. from that right. point. Because I go back and forth in my in my theater room, I go back and forth. I listen to two channel, then I then I turn the Dolby up mixer on, and I compare back and forth to see how the phantom center changes from just having a center channel present versus just right. two speakers imaging i've got it really close like you could almost not tell which, wow when you're sitting at the money seat but right. when you sit off to the left or the right you definitely mm. want it on wow that's 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 really <laughs> it it sounds like that's phenomenal calibration if you were able to it's painstaking <laughs> yeah painstaking <laughs> measuring you know we do uh, with my rbh system i did all fir correction so what i did with our rbh is we got the anechoic data from the speakers mm -hmm. we did the fir correction through that and then i adjusted everything below the room transition frequency 500 hertz with eq so wow. parametric eq at that point so when you look at the curves and i got to do a video on this when you look at the curves above the room transition frequency my lcrs at the money seat are like matched within a db or two wow yeah, that's you can't do that with passive speakers. It's virtually impossible. So that's the one. That's the one thing I wish we would see more of is active speakers with DSP built mm. in. I mean, that's once you go to that route, it's like it's just another level of of realism in the sound. Yep, I agree. Active speakers are a simpler setup too. Um, generally, like if you're adding in DSP and you're doing everything yeah. that's that that you're going through, it's a little bit more, but yeah, but if I agree with program, you, yeah. you can get right. really good. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I, I'm with you there. There should be more active speakers. Um, it simplifies things to an extent where there's less cables. <laughs> so part of, part of the struggle with active speakers is you got the old audio files that just want to have their special amplifiers because they think they create a synergy between the amplifier and the speaker when in reality, <laughs> The best synergy is to have no synergy at all, is to actually right. be able to customize. <laughs> exactly. And not have to ma make a crapshoot of saying, I need to mix this amplifier with that speaker and this cable to get this sound. No, right. we could all do this with DSP measurements with REW, right. and we could get things perfect, perfectly matched without having that analog crossover that's taken away right. from the whole experience. Yeah, I mean, active speakers, they put, they make the, manufacturer and the engineers like they do all the work for you yeah. they test this they calibrate it they decide what's the crossover frequency and the amplification power and how it all matches up um so you don't have to worry about that so yeah i'm with you there that um should be more of it uh it puts a lot of the emphasis on the on the on the manufacturers to kind of do the homework for you um, yep. which, um, yeah, that's another kind of, that's another pet peeve of mine that why don't the, the, the manufacturers that make separates and speakers, they never in their, in their recommendations, they, they, they'll, they'll never tell you which hardware to match it with. They just kind of like, here's our new speaker, go hook it up through receiver or whatever. But they, they never say in the lab, we tested it with this one and this one and this one. And if you like this, go with that. And if you want B, go with that. Like, 
Is that? Um... I think there's. I think when some companies like Sound United, for example, because they own amplifier company, they own receiver companies and speakers, they kind of mix systems together. Like they offer package deals, mostly. Right. I think probably because you get a better deal. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure somebody, some engineer at Sound United's like, you know what? When you get the Polk L800s, you need to have at least 200 watts RMS. Let's recommend this Marantz amplifier as opposed to this Denon receiver. Right. Um, I'm sure there's some of that that goes on. But yeah, and generally speaking, um, I don't know. I mean, unless you're going active, then an amplifier should be good enough to work with any speaker. I just don't, I don't like the whole, oh, I need to have a class A amplifier because it's going to sound better or a tube amplifier with my speaker. Yeah. What you're telling me is there's something off in the system. You need something with a low damping factor, like a tube amp to make your speaker sound like it has more bass. How about make the speaker better or fix your room acoustics rather than trying to fix it with a Band-Aid right, kind of approach? But, but there is system matching. You wouldn't disagree that certain amps won't sound good with certain speakers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. you don't want to okay. use a, you know, a wimpy receiver <laughs> amp with a speaker. Like I have the, uh, I have the Revels here, the F328s, and they, the manufacturer claims they're 8-ohm speakers. They're not 8-ohm speakers. They dip down to like 2.9 ohms. Uh, from like 100 to 300 hertz, I would not plug this speaker in with a you know $500 receiver. I've right. got the I've got an Anthem you know STR amplifier running them, which is mm. a stout amp that thing will handle right. two ohm loads. <laughs> right. So somebody here no um, basically said the Dolby surround up mixer with center spread is the way to go. I agree. All right. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of up mixing comparison lately on two channel music, and I've got Oro. I've got um, the Dolby up mixer and I've got the DTS one, which is complete trash. Don't use the DTS X up mixer. If you're going to do anything with music for two channel, cause it's garbage. And I've said it many times before, but the don't Dolby hold back. Surround, don't hold. Back. I don't, it's just so bad because DTS used to have a great up mixer when they had the cinema and they had the music modes, right. but now they just have one mode. You can't control the center at all. And it just blasts everything from the front channels into the center channel collapses your sound stage. Meanwhile, Dolby has the center spread feature, which they were taking out for a while because the receiver manufacturers, when they started uh, licensing the Dolby virtualization for height channels, mm -hmm. they got they quietly got rid of center spread. And I did a video and I just kind of went to town <laughs> saying we want our center spread back. And Sound right. United got flooded with emails because of that video. They brought it back. Oh, wow. So now all their receivers have the center spread feature, which when you turn that on, it just magically lets you have your your hmm. imaging from your front speakers, it gives you a little bit center fill, but it's not something that draws away from preserving your stereo image. And then you get, of course, the up mixing, which sounds great. Uh, it's very source dependent, but I find myself listening on a properly calibrated system. I find myself listening in up mix mode more than two channel. I would say probably 90% of the time. Hmm. The only time I listen to two channel now is if it's a brand new source that i'm listening to i want to just hear exactly what it's doing with my main speakers right. i want to hear the you know the recording the way it was meant to be and then i turn on the up mixer and usually i prefer it now interesting yeah i mean i i think there's two things simultaneously going on there's the post up mixer which is what you're talking about yeah and then there's the i guess you would call it the encoded mix if it's encoded in Dolby Atmos or Sony 360. That's well, yeah, that's not up mixing at that point, right? That's the that's at the mastering. Yeah, right. And then your playback system just un un uh, just reveals what's in the mix. Right. But those are kind of two different things that I don't know if people quite. No, yeah, so not. there's na there's native surround music, which we were talking about streaming, like the Dolby Atmos stuff. <laughs> right. And some of it's a hit or miss. So, so, like, if you listen to the Doors recording, that thing sounds freaking Riders on the Storm. That sounds amazing in Atmos. That wasn't recorded in Atmos. Right, right. But they took the, the analog tapes and they did their magic to it. And let me tell you something, man. That's one of my favorite sounding <laughs> recordings. And that's from, like, what? 1967 or 69 i don't remember when that came out but right. <laughs> probably before i was born and that's a long time ago uh yeah <laughs> man gene this has been fun <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. It's good that, you know, I like having you on here and I of course like having Ian and want to hear what you guys are covering because I can't Mm -hmm. cover everything. So it's awesome that you went to the show. You actually got on an airplane and went to California. No, I I was there. You're in in Cali, right? I'm in California. So luckily this was a 10 minute drive for me. Nice. uh, It was, uh, but I did have to weigh the whole COVID thing. I'm like, do I really want to go to a headphone show? Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, that's maybe another topic is really what's the future of these shows. Cause I mean, this was a small, I mean, relatively small yeah. show in one ballroom. I'm worried um, about Cedia, to be honest with you. That's the most important trade show in mm-hmm. our business. And last year was canceled this year. It was a, it was a dismal failure when everyone pulled out and we, we pulled out because everybody else did. I hope they could put it back together next year because I like doing the virtual coverage online. You know, we do the virtual press events, Mm -hmm. but there's nothing that replaces a real trade show. Right. Sitting down with the product, meeting the manufacturers, you know, mingling. Yep. There's nothing like having the tactile experience. You just can't recreate that with a pair of headphones or virtualization or if you want to. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, we need shows. Um, I mean, I have a theory that these shows need to evolve into spectacles. Like they need to be more of a party, like South by Southwest or something where there's music and there's audio. It's not just people crowded into a into a hotel room. Like yeah. there needs to be more of a community aspect of it. I don't know. That's my theory on where these shows could go. Uh, instead of just cramming into these hotel ballrooms or hotel rooms uh, for people that haven't been to shows, most of the listening, you go into like a a modified hotel room and they yeah. jammed in a bunch of speakers and amps and strung cables all over the floor and they set it up in, in about 24 hours and hopefully they did their homework and got it to sound good, so... Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit inside stuff on some of these audio shows, but, uh, yeah, yeah. there are, I mean, there are a lot of fun. There are a lot of work for us to cover, but, uh, I don't know. I just hope they, I hope they survive. Like you said, they need to evolve at some point. And, um, I just hope we focus more on the technologies that interest the next generation of people rather than just holding on to the old ideals of you know magic cables and magic tweaks and <laughs> right you know magic markers on your pen on your cds to you know, that stupid stuff but right, right well i mean ces is the next show coming up for january yeah it's just not really focused on home theater anymore it's just too much tech and mm-hmm. i i got turned off by ces i stopped going maybe seven years eight years ago i just right it's too broad like it's it's good for consumer electronics but it's really not focused for what we're doing Hmm. no yeah they've i mean the other fascinating part about all of these shows is the biggest company in the in the in on the planet doesn't go to them and that would be apple like apple sets the bar for like almost everything oh that's true yeah and apple is not there um, they do their own show. That's they, they do their own events. Yeah. <laughs> and they're pretty good. I don't know if you watch their videos, but Apple. I mean, I, back in the day with Steve Dobbs. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what made them, you know. Yeah. I mean, Apple's product um, unveils are just, they set the bar for how to launch a product. And I think that's why they sell billions of them. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's something that Apple is a bigger. And I think you talked about this with Sean Olive. Apple AirPods is a bigger, mm-hmm. it's a bigger market than the entire high-end headphone market or yeah. the entire headphone market. The enti- everyone just that else, one product. Just that yeah. one product. Um, and they so put that, a lot of resources and, they, and their headphone products are good because they put a lot of resources into it. You know, they have a lot of tech. They have a, they have their own anechoic chamber. So they know what they're doing. I think they have a right. headphone track. They're one of the first to have headphone tracking. Uh, built into their headphones i think the new airpods yeah. have them yeah airpods or airpods max i believe yeah uh, i believe those are the ones um but yeah i mean apple is <laughs> everything they do like uh 
they get rid of the headphone jack <laughs> as an example and that infuriated like, everybody five years ago when it happened now it's normal now right. it's, it's almost like when we had av receivers and processors i think emotiva was the first that said you know what we're not having any legacy connections anymore we're just having hdmi no composite no <laughs> yep. component video i'm like yeah. you're crazy now <laughs> it's almost impossible the Japanese receiver companies give you one or two component video inputs, a couple of S right. uh, regular video, no S video. And yeah, right. I mean, it's just when you think about it at the end of the day, it's time to move on. It's time, you know, <laughs> right. Everything is HDMI based now. So, all right, Brian. Well, it was nice having you again, guys. Yeah. I'll put the links down below for acoustics.com. Uh, Brian went out to Can Jam to cover their headphone show. You could read about his report. Thank Guys, you. don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get access to us if you want to ask questions, if you want to suggest video topics. Brian, again, it was a pleasure to see you face-to-face. -face. It's been Thank a you. long time. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, this has been phenomenal. Uh, very, very grateful um, to be on the king of audio on YouTube <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, appreciate that. That's what you guys are. So thank you. Um, honored to be here. And uh, yeah, hopefully next week you can talk to Ian White. Uh, hopefully he'll be back to talk about some news of the week and yeah. show and tell. We had a couple of weeks going of, of that. So um, yep, definitely. hopefully we'll get back to the usual routine. But yeah, thank you. And um, dude, I've known you for <laughs> over two decades, man. I know, you know, crazy. I mean, craziness. It's crazy. Uh, we're still here running these websites that we started we're getting old, in, the, we're getting, in the 90s we're not young i mean you look younger than me but we're not young i don't know, I don't know. maybe <laughs> it's dark sorry about the lighting i need a better camera and background one of these times it'll look better so yeah we'll get you next time get you all right guys well Thank that's you. a wrap and until next time my friends keep listening Christmas.